Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Get things out of the way here. There we go. Um, Encompass Live is the Nebraska Library Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a uh, variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. Um, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, as we are doing right now, and it is then posted onto our Encompass Live website, and I'll show you at the end of today's show. Um, where you can um, access those archives. Um, we Both the live show and the archive recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and that is for all types of libraries in, in the state. Um, so public, academic, uh, K-12 schools, um, correction facilities, museums, anything that's got a library to it, we are the state agency for them. Um, so you will find sessions on our um, upcoming shows and in our archives that will cover really the whole gamut of anything libraries. Um, we do a mixture of things on his, on the show here, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, um, anything uh, cool things we think libraries could be doing, cool things libraries are doing. Um, so our only real criteria is that it's library, something to do with libraries. Um, we do uh, have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes do presentations and sessions for things that are very specific to here in Nebraska, but we bring in guest speakers sometimes, and that's what we have this morning with me today. Um, today we're talking about nonprofit basics for libraries, and uh, Trev Peterson is here with me. Good morning, Trev. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And he is from um, right here in Lincoln, the law firm right here in based in Lincoln, correct? Right, I'm from the Knudsen, Berkheimer, Richardson, and Endicott law firm here in Lincoln. Um, am I ready to roll? Um, yeah, and um, this is a session that um, was actually um, suggested by um, some libraries asking, um, and our uh, regional library systems, um, one of our regional library system directors. For those of you not in Nebraska, we have four regional library systems that are kind of the consultants in different areas of the state um, on behalf of the commission. And um, Eric Jones, who is the system director for our, what we call our Three Rivers Library System in the northeast corner of the state, um, set up this session for us. He had a lot of questions from library directors about um, what do I do with taxes and fundraising and foundations and statutes? And there's a lot to it, of course. Um, and um, he arranged for Trev to come here and join us. And Eric was on the line just a uh, little while ago. Uh, it looks like he's gotten disconnected. So hopefully he'll join us back again and be able to participate as, as well if anything he has to say about anything. Um, but yeah, I'll just hand it over to you, Trev, to go ahead and take it away and tell us okay. um, the basics of what we might be talking about today. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. The uh, topic area is very broad, uh, sort of like libraries, tell me what you know. <laughs> uh, so I tried to pick a few areas uh, that, that I wanted to talk about specifically. And uh, sort of by way of introduction, uh, I do practice law in Lincoln. Um, my practice is primarily, well, it's, it's, it's exclusively civil law. I don't do any criminal law. Don't do any family law. Uh, do some business organization work, real estate, uh, and contract work. I uh, have worked with a number of the uh, regional uh, groups here mm -hmm. a couple, three years ago when we consolidated. I, th I think there were six and we went to four. There was, was, yeah. We originally yeah. had six regions and we yeah, made them a little more uh, easier to deal with the four. So I had a chance to work with a number uh, of your members. And I just wanted to do a couple disclosure things. First one is I'm not a government lawyer, never have been. So if the questions relate specifically to government, I will try to answer them as best I can. Uh, but the, the person uh, who really knows the answer to the question is your local county attorney or your local city attorney. Mm -hmm. They are available to talk to. Uh, and if they don't know the answer, they can certainly direct you to someone who does. Uh, Second thing I wanted to point out is I decided that today would be officially pick on Wisconsin Day. 
<laughs> so uh, if any of you are from Wisconsin or, and are offended by anything I say about Wisconsin, uh, that's too bad. Um, there are examples. <laughs> there, there are examples. So uh, one of the issues that we run into a lot in dealing with uh, nonprofit corporations is the, well, other nonprofits do it. And I'll tell them, I'm going to tell a nonprofit that what you're doing is not legally correct. And mm -hmm. well, somebody else does it. Well, I'm sorry, but you know, that, that hasn't worked since kindergarten and we all know it. <laughs> all right. And it didn't work with my mom and I'm sure it didn't work <laughs> with your mom and it doesn't mm -hmm. work with your kids. So the fact that others do it uh, is, is not an indication that they are uh, doing it correctly, especially when we're dealing with fundraising. Mm -hmm. uh, the other issue a lot of times is, well, the church down the street does it. Well, there's a difference between the church mm -hmm. down the street and the library. Oh, yes. Uh, and it's a huge difference. Uh, and you'll see that when we get to the uh, sales tax exemptions and some of the bingo lottery things, that there's special rules that apply for churches. Mm -hmm. And you can't... <clears throat> assume that because a church can do something that all nonprofits uh, can do something. Uh, then we always get the, well, this is the way we've always done it uh, comment. And uh, the problem with that is you may be doing it wrong. So uh, we have to kind of break through that. And now we come to my favorite part where we get to pick on Wisconsin. <laughs> I'm from Wisconsin and we did it in Wisconsin. Uh, <laughs> If you look at a map, you'll find that we're in Nebraska and the laws do vary from state to state. So what may be legal in one state may it's not be different. legal in another. So you have to be very, very careful, uh, especially uh, the I'm from Wisconsin and that's the way we did it here. Or my other favorite one is I met a person at a conference from Wisconsin and this is what they and that's how they do it there. Well, you know, again, this isn't Wisconsin. It's Nebraska, so we do have to be careful uh, about that. I'm going to put a plug in for all of your local lawyers. Um, we are not the heartless snakes that most people think we are. Well, no, most of most. us. <laughs> well, some of us are not heartless. Generally, there is a lawyer in your community uh, who, if asked, uh, would be willing to advise your board, usually for free. Mm -hmm. um, now you do need to respect their time so if you're planning a massive lottery operation to call a lawyer on a Thursday and say hey we're starting tomorrow uh, no, do that. that's you know, please uh, as as a volunteer my rule of thumb is if you call me the day before an event my answer is almost always no because you've known about the event for a long yeah. time Mm -hmm. And uh, it's really disrespectful uh, for your volunteers to ask them to, to show up on short notice unless it's an emergency uh, and everything isn't an emergency. So uh, with those kind of general comments, let me let me take you through what I think I'm going to talk about and then we'll answer your questions. And I do recommend that if you have questions, uh, you can either you have two options here. One is you listen to me drone on. And I'll also give you a bad pun warning. I, I'm not going to identify where they are, but somewhere today there will be bad puns. <laughs> so we're going to start talking about statutes uh, that deal with uh, nonprofit uh, corporations in Nebraska. Uh, then we're going to do a little work on fundraising uh, and sales tax. Uh, we have some interlocal uh, agreement questions. And then I, we have a couple of questions that were submitted ahead of time. Mm -hmm. um, if you are submitting a question, uh, I, I would say, for our purposes, please try not to identify your city or county, if, if you can get by without doing it. Uh, and for the two questions we have, they did identify their counties. I'm going to try, try to, to ex mention. expunge yeah. those uh, county mm -hmm. references. And if I make a mistake, I apologize ahead of time to the person asking the question. That's on me, not on them. And if you do accidentally type in your county or, or library out of habit, just because like into the text questions, I will triage it and read it appropriately and not mention um, any details to keep all the privacy. Yeah. I Again, should al I should also mention that I'm licensed to practice in Nebraska. So if you ask me a Wisconsin law question, the answer <laughs> is I don't know. 
you need to have somebody in Wisconsin. You have to yes. talk to somebody with the Wisconsin ticket, and I do not have one of those. So let's take a look, first of all, at the Nebraska statutes. Now, uh, as librarians, you should be able to find these. The legislature has a an excellent website where you can go through and, and look at the uh, entire uh, stat, all of the statutes in Nebraska, uh, and they're very easy to find. Uh, I'll direct you, uh, well, Krista here is, uh, scanning the uh, internet for this stuff, uh, we're, we're in section 21, and the Nonprofit uh, Corporation Act starts in the uh, 1900 series. So if you just yeah, and you do the Nebraska statutes, you can get a lot of links here. But they do have a search here um, that you can um, search the different laws. It looks like so um, either by a topic, or well, here you can search by keyword if you're not sure what the section is. I'm not sure how good that works. Uh, or you can search the laws or bills. Um, so let's see if so, we do. So if you do the best one to search. For. Well, let's we'll start with 21-1951. Uh, you can also search by section number if you happen to know it. And then it will take us down to the uh, Nebraska Revised. You can just click on, click on any one of those if you want to. That in the 21-1900 series. Because that'll get us to the uh, that gets us to the nonprofit corporation. corporation act. Now, mm -hmm. a couple of comments when you're looking at the statutes. Uh, Twenty one, Title Twenty One deals with business organizations, um, so there will be the Limited Liability uh, Company Act, for example, is Twenty One Dash One Hundred. The for profit is Twenty One, and I believe that's either. 2000 or 1800, it's right around here. So make sure you get on the Nonprofit Corporation Act because if mm -hmm. you don't, that's not the uh, sections that apply uh, to nonprofits. Corporations are uh, creatures of uh, statute. Uh, so we have to follow the statutes. This is a link to those. You can look at those. Uh, and I'm just going to highlight a few things that uh, we constantly have uh, questions about. Uh, the first thing is, if you look at any one of these uh, statutes, you're going to see that the uh, act, which I believe is a uniform act, was adopted in Nebraska in 1996. So mm -hmm. let's think for a second about 1996. Oh, do we have to? We, yes, we have to. <laughs> I, I was alive in 1996. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in fact, uh, my children would say I was alive in 1886, <laughs> but that is not true. Uh, but if you think about 1996, in the Peterson household, uh, our internet connection was dial-up. Uh, so you'd mm -hmm. plunk in the number for, uh, at the time, America Online for us, and then you'd wait forever because the telephone lines were always busy, and uh, the, your internet connection was terrible. Uh, it would be so unacceptable today oh, that, yeah. that it's almost unbelievable. But if you think about 1996, people didn't have email addresses as a general rule. They, they didn't have smartphones. Uh, they, did, they, weren't, they didn't exist. In fact, I think we were probably still using our bag phone in the car. You know, it's, it's thing was like a huge monster. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, the guys were really tech savvy, had the brick. Uh, and it cost them an arm and a leg for cell service. <laughs> so that's 1996. That's where this statute comes from. And, and has not been updated since. There may have been parts of it that have been amended from time to time, but the parts that we want amended have not been amended since 1996, and that's a that's a huge problem. So, if any of you know a state senator, this might be an opportunity for you to say, hey, you know, we're 1996 with the uh, Nonprofit Corporation Act, which means that we're probably dealing with technology from the mid 1980s. Can we maybe move it mm. to 2010? You know, we don't need to maybe move it quite to 2019, but at least if we could stay, get in the uh, 2000s. yeah, if we could get in the <laughs> 2000s, it might be it might be cool. So, what does that mean in terms of meetings? Uh, you for your annual uh, meeting, there's a provision in uh, section 21-1951 and uh, a subsection C uh, if you're kind of following along, uh, and it allows. Uh, unless your articles or bylaws provide otherwise, it allows members to participate in annual and regular meetings by conference or by uh, means of communication. And the statute says by which all members participating may simultaneously hear each other during the meeting. Um, 
and then mm -hmm. further says that a member participating by this means is deemed to be present at the meeting. So, and I remember mm -hmm. when, when this came in for, for the business corporation side, and we thought, hey, this is a big deal because now you can have board of director meetings, you can have member meetings by conference, conference telephone call. call. Yeah. And uh, certainly it doesn't require that it be conference telephone call, so Skype would work. Something uh, like this, what we're using, GoToWebinar. GoToWebinar would hear. work mm -hmm. as long as everybody can hear each other. You don't even have to be able to see each other, you just have to be able to hear each other. Mm -hmm. So that's a huge, huge advantage for people in uh, uh, rural Nebraska, particularly where you may have uh, members who might have to drive several hours uh, to come to a meeting that might last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that uh, many of the organizations uh, have their annual meetings at uh, other other meetings uh, where librarians would normally be at. So if right. there was like a, a, things, a yeah. public school conference, uh, they'd break out and have a little meeting afterwards. And, and you know, again, absolutely great idea, but you do have the ability, as long as people can hear uh, every, everything that's said at the meeting, you can participate by conference. Especially those things, you, we just need a quick vote on something. Um, and you can, there's a way to do that. You yeah. can do that by phone. So, and that's interesting because you just mentioned that, you know, these, these those 96 and things you're updating, that one was actually written loosely enough that it covers any like anything we're using now we don't need to um yeah that one might not need updating because it's just as long as you can hear as long as you can hear yeah now we we move from the conference telephone call to the next logical step in life which is email can you vote by email so the answer is maybe <laughs> um and this is where the statute could use a little tweaking i think uh Section 21-1954 uh, provides uh, for action by written consent. That's action of the members by written consent. And uh, the statute indicates that members can, can vote by written consent and the action needs to be uh, signed by those members representing 80% of the voting power. So if you have members, it's probably a one person, one vote uh, scenario. So if you had 80% of your people s signing off on a written consent, uh, you know that's, that's acceptable under the statute. Now, what does written consent mean? I would say in 1996, it means that you get a pen and you get a piece of paper and you sign your name to it and you mail the piece of paper back mm -hmm. to the uh, committee and in fact or to the nonprofit and in fact I think when we were doing some of the uh, merger uh, deals back about four or five years ago however long ago that was mm -hmm. uh, we had some that did written consent and they they solicited their members by and and received written consent for the mm -hmm. the merger others uh, I think another group had a meeting so we were we were kind of all over the place on how we were doing this but uh, there is some flexibility there I would say it doesn't say it has to be on paper I would say that an email is most likely written consent uh, as long mm -hmm. as it has uh, your electronic uh, signature if you will on it mm -hmm. that that would be written consent that would comply with the statute there are some requirements that the secretary needs to uh, put copies of those written consents in with the minutes and as I think as a general rule uh, for a member meeting I would probably say that uh, you, you probably should ratify that at your next at your next members meeting this is one where we can certainly use some help from the legislature yeah the director side is worse and that's where we need help more <laughs> but this there's at least there's at least something here that would allow us to actually you know be in 2019 mm -hmm. uh, for a change and then there's also uh, under uh, section uh, 21 1958 the uh, nonprofit can take the members can take action by written ballot so you can send a ballot out and they can sign the send uh, mm -hmm. sign the ballot and send it back so there are ways to do that you know in my opinion email should qualify as a written ballot mm -hmm. as well sure. but I am I'm certainly willing to concede that there would be other lawyers who have uh, other opinions on that yeah because so. these things you're saying you know, signing something like an actual signature 
that's the uh, that's the one part that I wonder how how strict is that with actually having to sign your name as opposed to replying to an email and saying yes I vote on this or I agree or whatever but there's no like actual here's my scribbled signature that's the that's, when you're doing using email unless you have which we did here for some things we have to sign multiple yeah. like letters for people we have an electronic signature scanned and we can stick it into like for him sending out like a hundred letters to libraries but yeah, there, and that's where the statute needs some help. Yeah, because they need to. Update, there are yeah. services that are, that are kind of pricey, like uh, you know DocuSign or VeriSign. Oh, yeah. And okay. uh, right. the realtors certainly, if, if any of your uh, board members are realtors, they're going to be familiar with those because mm -hmm. a lot of uh, home contracts now are signed digitally yeah. and electronically. Um, you know, mm -hmm. is there an opportunity that uh, you know, your board member, uh, you know, Sally Jones is a uh, little four-year-old daughter. Uh, you know, Mary Jones is uh, on mom's computer and <laughs> then votes in favor of something for mom <laughs> using her. Yeah, you know, that's know. that's out there. Yeah. Uh, I would tell you that I think that the, well, the work the library commission and the libraries do is important. You know, you're not a high hacker priority I and I and I'm not so worried about a three or four year old yeah. accidentally voting in favor of a particular uh, item. more story time <laughs> yeah, more story time but I mean it, the the opportunities are there uh, mm -hmm. certainly if somebody wanted to be nefarious about it they could get on your computer vote then go back in and delete both the email and the uh, mm -hmm. voting email and then you wouldn't know that you'd voted in favor of something but uh, Things we do in libraries don't really. Yeah, you do know, that. Uh, Robert Ludlum probably does not <laughs> write uh, thrillers about librarians, so I don't, I don't think that that's they should, a very, though, a, very but that's a different hybrid. discussion. <laughs> but, well, yeah, let's see, is he dead? I was going to say we could have. I think he maybe he may still be alive, but uh, maybe he'll write a library thriller for you. Mm -hmm. So uh, that this is one area though where we could use a little updating on that, uh, and we'll look mostly at the director's one. Uh, the director uh, statutes, uh, which is in uh, 21-1980, allows director meetings to be uh, done by, uh, again, we, we call it conference telephone call, but it is any kind of a, of a uh, connection where you can hear everybody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose for that is that, they, that the directors can then hear uh, the positions that other people are taking. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like I said, this is this is a huge deal, especially if you have to have an emergency meeting. Uh, you can have your director uh, phone in, Skype in, uh, FaceTime in, or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a, per, a director again participating in this manner is deemed to be present in person at the meeting. So uh, you can count them for a quorum, uh, and their votes are going to be, uh, you know, valid. Mm -hmm. So the next question then is, well, what happens if we want to send out a uh, email and say, hey, we want you as the directors of the association, we have an opportunity to buy a dozen computers for the libraries in our mm -hmm. area. And the opportunity is going to pass unless we take immediate action and we don't want to, for whatever reason, have a telephone call, which would be permitted under the statute clearly, mm -hmm. and the, the uh, action taken there would be valid and binding uh, on, the, uh, on the association. We're going to do it by email because, after all, that's easiest. And the statute doesn't really permit that, but it kind of does. It, it, that's, that's the frustrating thing about this. Again, back in 1996, nobody had email. Okay. So if we look at the directors and officers uh, in section 1981 it's action without a meeting and uh, the directors can act without a meeting uh, but if the action the action has to be taken by all members of the board and it can be uh, evidenced by one or more written consents describing the action that's taken signed by each director and then those are included uh, in the minutes and then the action is effective when it's signed by the last director. Now, the problem with this uh, is that it, it says all the members of the board. Uh -huh. 
so if we're out on on email for example uh and and you email Trev and I do not respond then everything's held up everything's held up until the last person responds uh, so it would be nice to have uh, the ability to vote by email even if it had to be an extraordinary majority uh, mm -hmm. of responses by email it would be nice to be able to have that in the statute to, mm -hmm. to clarify that you can do it now if all your members reply back and say yes everything's fine because I think at that point you have a written vote their email response email is probably their signature and I mm -hmm. think there's there's enough law around there that we could argue that point yeah. um, but the email is it's a huge issue I know it's it's been an issue in our church for a while we take mm -hmm. action based on email and what we should really do then procedurally is after you take the action is go ahead at the next uh, board meeting and ratify those decisions right. uh, that a lot makes of it official right yeah, after it's, the fact, yeah. it, it, and, and I know it's after the fact and if you've already spent the money and bought the computers and then you know your ratification fails uh, you know, <laughs> you're you're kind of running a risk there but presumably if it's controversial uh, you're probably not going to want to do it by email you probably want to have a meeting anyway and always remember you can do that conference telephone call mm -hmm. and yeah. that's clearly allowed under the statute and action taken at that conference telephone call is binding on the directors uh, and if you have a quorum you don't have to have all the directors either you can just have a quorum for that yeah so you know, keep that in mind uh, and you know I apologize for the statutes but you know, I'm not a legislator, and I don't know what the reaction would be down there uh, if we tried to to make some modifications. I will tell you, I, I do believe this is a uniform act, and uh, while the uniform acts are not the Ten Commandments, the uh, commissioners who come up with these uniform acts, which are basically law professors and lawyers, uh, some judges in a number of states mm -hmm. treat the Uniform Act as though they're just absolutely sacred. Mm -hmm. uh, so getting a state specific amendment, you know, it's not impossible, uh, but the first thing you're going to run into is the uniform commissioners are going to say, well, your act's not going to be uniform. Yeah. And the response is, yeah, well, so what? <laughs> this is Nebraska, not Wisconsin. We're doing it in here, yes. <laughs> okay. Now, I wanted to move on to the library law uh, issues on some fundraising and um, I have a memo that was done by Stephanie Otto, who is a uh, law clerk in our office. She's a second year law student. Uh, we will have that available. I, I should have sent it to Krista uh, already, but when I get back to the email, to the office, I will email it to her. Uh, Krista will be more than happy yes. to send it to yep. anybody who Definitely. wants it. Just go ahead and send her an email and we'll get it out to you. And we'll try to get that out. To, well, I'll get it to Krista today and then she can get it out. Yeah. Uh, I do want to put Stephanie, uh, put the by Stephanie on there because she That's deserves true. credit. She did all the work. And um, it's got all the links to the different things we're going to show you are in this document. Um, so don't worry about trying to scribble down the URLs we go to or anything. Um, we'll have this out to you for, for you to be able to. And it's all. Um, right. And you you, can, you yeah. should be able to hyperlink to them or if you yeah. can, you can copy the link into your into your browser mm -hmm. and if all else fails you can go to the Nebraska Department of Revenue's right website here, yeah. and you can use the search function and it, it, the search function works pretty well it's a little clunky but it, it works pretty well so it uh, happens by typing nonprofits and then you get to the uh, to the tax issue and then regulations about donation um, so a uh, couple of things about fundraising uh, number one the, the typical fundraising, uh, let's say, for example, I know we have one question here where they're talking about raising money to build a addition to their library. That's that's traditional fundraising. Mm -hmm. There are no sales tax implications of that at all. If you come to me on the street and say, Trev, I know that uh, you know you're kind of a library rat. So we, we need to expand the library, which you contribute, and I can write you a check. That's mm -hmm. perfectly fine. Uh, if you're saying, Trev, we need new computers at the library, and I'll say, well, I've got a computer I can donate. I mean, I can do that. That's perfectly fine. There's mm -hmm. no sales tax issue there. There's 
All you need to do, give me a receipt so I can deduct it uh, on my federal income taxes. Uh, that that kind of fundraising, very very traditional, uh, something that most uh, nonprofits uh, you know do quite regularly. Now, where nonprofits start to get into a little bit of trouble here is when we try to be a little bit more uh, esoteric and we do a few other things, which are legal. It's just that you have to pay attention to the rules. And uh, Stephanie uh, went through and found uh, a guidebook that so the, here, yep. that uh, Krista brought up here for us. So this is this is nice. Now, I will tell you as a lawyer that this is the Department of Revenue's view of the law. Okay. The Department of Revenue is, of course, going to say that everything is taxable. <laughs> they may be right most of the time. They want all the money. But they may not be entirely correct. So, you know, if you're dealing with something where you want to be on the edge, uh, you know, I would say check with that volunteer local lawyer mm -hmm. and just see what their thought, what their thoughts are. Uh, or your, your accountant, uh, you probably have one either for the foundation or the tax preparer. Uh, you know, they may be able to look at, at mm -hmm. some of these things online and say, yeah, you know, I think the department's right. That is taxable or no, that department's wrong. Uh, I will say they're pretty fair about this. But uh, so I would say probably 90 percent of the time or 99 percent of the time, they're, they're going to be pretty close to being accurate. Mm -hmm. But remember, they're raising taxes. Uh, and our job, of course, is not to pay taxes. <laughs> Uh, well, we fought a revolution over that. You so, did. Uh, you so um, what the department will tell us is um, what about collecting sales tax? So, for items purchased and resold, do you have to collect sales tax? So, let's take a quick step back and say, gee, what does that mean? Well, that means that you have to fill out the application for a sales tax permit. I believe that's uh, form 20, if I remember correctly. And uh, you then have to you get a certificate from the uh, mm -hmm. Department of Revenue that has your sales tax number on it. And you're supposed to display that in connection with your sales. So if you have that in restaurants all the time, yeah, you see it in restaurants, you sh it should be. It's supposed to be displayed somewhere. I don't know where we find it at Target, but uh, <laughs> yeah, it should be displayed somewhere. Uh, so you then you need you do need to collect sales tax um, on items that are purchased and resold. Uh, I specifically asked Stephanie about book sales. Yes, those are uh, you have to collect sales tax there. If uh, an item is donated to you and you sell it, uh, you're selling a good, so you have to collect the sales tax. Uh, pancake feeds, uh, yes, but I think that that answer may be more maybe. Uh, and, and let's maybe uh, take a, a quick stop here and, and think about this. If you're if you're selling a ticket for a pancake feed, you're selling something, mm -hmm. right? So if, if it's ten bucks to come to my pancake feed, I now I, I'm selling you a service. Just like if we went to Village Inn and to buy and, and, and got dinner and, there, yeah, and, and bought dinner there. there. It's yeah. this it's the same deal. Now if it's a free will offering. I'm not selling you anything. Hmm. So it seems to me that if it's a free will offering, there ought to be an exception there. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you want to keep that in mind. So uh, if it's a, uh, and I think you can have a suggested donation. I don't think yeah. that's a problem because if the suggested donation is, let's say $10, but my free will offering is $5, if I can still eat pancakes for $5 and live with the grief that that's going <laughs> to cost me, then that's fine, um, and it should not be taxable at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, like car washes, for example, they say they're taxable unless it's a free will donation. So if you're doing a car wash, mm -hmm. which I think would be kind of unusual for a library, I, it usually eh, usually it's high school cheerleaders, yeah. that, that, <laughs> and you know they make they make the money that way. Um, now there is no uh, sales tax on things like raffles and bingo. We'll talk mm -hmm. about that later because there are some special uh, raffle and uh, bingo ex, uh, requirements. So any kind of free will donation, I think you're probably okay. Um, and then if you're a government entity, uh, you're still required to, to collect uh, sales tax. And there's a guide 
that the Department of Revenue also puts out for governmental entities uh, to tell you whether your activity uh, requires you to collect uh, sales tax or not. And there are a number of exceptions to the sales tax uh, collections. Uh, you know, again, those are provided uh, in the regulations that you can get on the website. And um, Stephanie has included those hyperlinks in this memo that we will have available for you. Um, you know, I, I think the basic rule is if you're if you're buying something like admission to an event or something, if you're buying it for a stated price, uh, it's probably have to collect the sales tax. If it's totally free will, then I don't think there would be any uh, sales tax issues. That's kind there. of your cutoff there. Yeah. I think that's the cutoff because we're you're selling a good versus uh, you know not selling a good. There's information here on how you collect the tax, how often you have to file the returns and things like that. Uh, yeah, Form 20, like you said. Yeah, yep. yeah, Form 20 will get you the permit. And then uh, the one thing about it, uh, when the Department of Revenue sends these quarterly forms out, if you don't if you don't send it back, then that raises the question of, well, do you have have you had any sales and you're just not reporting? Mm -hmm. So what I do and what I recommend for people is, if you don't have any sales, you can take that form and you can take your pen and you can make a zero, real easy. You know, it's just like you draw a circle <laughs> and you put a zero sale and you go down to the bottom where it says tax collected zero and then you sign it and send it back in. What does that do? Uh, you know, the the department then knows that you haven't collected anything. Now, do read the instructions uh, because it's been a long time since I filled out a sales tax form. And I know I had a small business at one time that had sales about once a year and we get the quarterly statements over and over and over again. And finally, I got on the annual reporting cycle and, and that worked out uh, pretty good. And it just depends on how much tax liability. If it's less than $900 of collected uh, sales tax, you have an annual reporting requirement. I think I, I had set it up quarterly and I never I never got above $900. So that finally, we got it to annual. But yeah. do read the instructions. Uh, uh, my, my advice is the same with uh, if if you have employees, I don't know that many of our nonprofits would, well, they, they could have employees. Uh, if you've got withholding taxes or uh, mm -hmm. unemployment taxes uh, and you get those returns to come out and you have no employees or maybe you have a seasonal employee, so you have an employee during the summer maybe, but not the rest of the time, don't not don't just not send the form back. I think you're better off to put zeros in and send it back. It At has to be true. It has to be yeah. true. But put zeros in it, send it back, because then they're going to be happy, because then they have a form. You're doing and the paper. Yes. Yeah, if they have a paper. form that checks that checks the uh, checks the box for them, so they're happy with that. Uh, and again, uh, the memo has a bunch of hyperlinks to information. Uh, yeah. Stephanie did a really really good job with this. So um, now we're going to talk about bingo, B I. NGO. Um, Nebraska has some uh, requirements on bingo and I think what I'm going to do is just kind of do this from uh, 80,000 feet because I don't know how many of you are going to be uh, interested in the bingo license um, and it depends a little bit on uh, how, how large the prizes are uh, and there's some specific requirements so I'm going to assume that in terms of uh, the, the kind of bingo games we're going to be running would be more of a special event uh, type uh, bingo permit because you're probably not going to be running uh, bingo on a regular basis. Uh, you know, if you are, then uh, look into the, the full-fledged uh, licensing. Uh, there's some limitations. Uh, there's called small stakes uh, bingo games. Uh, and I would never have thought that I'd be talking <laughs> to librarians about bingo. I mean, if you anything you to raise money, funds. I mean, libraries yeah. are always looking at you know that's why a lot of the questions were about fundraising and how do we do it and how do we do it legally. Um, there's only so much in budgets in our cities and counties for them, and things like uh, raffles and bingos and um, like I said, selling anything selling stuff, is yeah, how they need to, you know, s sometimes support some of their 
basic and, services. And I know the, the volunteer firemen, uh, my wife is, is from a, a farm in Greeley County and uh, the, the volunteer fire department has an annual pancake feed. Mm -hmm. It's a free will donation, so they don't have a sales tax issue there. Hooray for them. Uh, it's their big fundraiser, and mm -hmm. it's a big community event. Everybody comes and supports mm -hmm. that, and that's cool. That's really great. It doesn't work very well in Lincoln, but you know, <laughs> it works well in, in those small communities. Uh, the special event, bingo, uh, they say two special events, but must not exceed a total of 14 days. So I, I, they must be looking for two really long special wow. events. Okay. Uh, the bingo cannot be the primary function of your event, so you have to have some other draw. Uh, the cards can't cost more than a quarter each, and uh, no single prize can exceed $25 in value. And then there's some requirements on uh, the bingo workers uh, cannot be paid, and they have to be at least 18 years old. So uh, your six-year-old uh, cannot run uh, the bingo game for you. Uh, I, uh, to me, this Indeed. some of these requirements are just bizarre. <laughs> uh, I don't know where this comes. And, oh, yeah, here the event must be held in the county where the organization has its principal office. Oh, okay. So if your principal office is, let's say, in Dodge County, Fremont, mm -hmm. you can't go to Columbus to mm -hmm. have, uh, have, an, have an event. So, huh. uh, you know, if, if you're doing bingo, so here here's my tip on bingo, like I said before. This is one of those deals where if you're thinking about it, you ought to start by looking at what the legal requirements are to determine whether or not it makes any sense for you to do it. And if it does, then uh, go ahead and get the get the license and you can conduct your bingo games. Uh, lottery raffles, uh, that again is covered pretty well. I wanna try to get to questions here and, and we can mm -hmm. always come back to this. Again, it's covered very well in Stephanie's memo. Uh, let me it kind of, it, See if I can do this now without explaining. Well, I can't. Um, <laughs> the Boy Scouts, uh, Cornusker Council, uh, at one time um, raffled off uh, a, a commemorative uh, rifle uh, that was created for the 100th anniversary of uh, the founding of Boy Scouts in the United States. And cool. the, the mm -hmm. rifle itself was donated. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's a cool piece. It's a collector's piece. Uh, and they decided, well, hey, let's do this online. So mm -hmm. they would sell tickets to you, you know, the normal way. Uh, and then they stopped online process because they ran afoul not of the state bingo law, but of the federal firearms laws. Oh. Because you're soliciting now for the sale of uh, firearms, firearms across the state line. Oh, and uh, nobody thinks about that. No. But if you put anything out on the Internet, it's for everyone. It's everywhere. Yeah. It's worldwide. So, you know, so if you're going to have a rifle raffle and try to say that three times fast, <laughs> you want to you want to think about those kind of requirements in, uh, or prohibitions in addition mm -hmm. to. Um, so be careful of what, yeah, you're, careful what you're raffling. What, what, you're, raffling. what your prize is going to be is also is going to matter potentially. Yeah. And it, it could be the same thing if it was a box of wine or oh, yeah. something like that mm -hmm. uh you know dinner dinner with trev peterson which <laughs> you know you probably wouldn't sell a ticket for uh but uh, any of those uh, uh kinds of uh lotteries and raffles mm -hmm. you want to you want to look at what it is you're selling to make sure that whatever it is you're selling uh you're selling it in a way that is not illegal so if mm -hmm. it has alcohol you want to make sure that uh, anybody who buys a ticket has to be over 21. You're not right. going to be able to determine that on the internet. Online, no. And I doubt, quite frankly, that you're going to probably want to be doing much of your sales online because I don't know that you'd get anything out of that. Yeah, and the shipping and everything is for some of these things better to keep it local. Keep yeah, it, keep um, it, keep it local. Keep it analog and, <laughs> off. The... And certain, but you can certainly solicit contributions online. That's yeah. that's not a problem. But it's when you're selling stuff. You got to be concerned about that. So again, you're going to want to look at these specific requirements for uh, who can part, who can be a participant, who can operate it, whether you need a special permit. All of that is covered in in Stephanie's memo. And then she also tossed in uh, donor acknowledgement letters uh, for the IRS. So if somebody mm -hmm. gives you uh, more than 250 bucks in a single contribution, uh, they they would need a an acknowledgement letter. Uh, again, it could be a form letter, it could be a little receipt, um, 
depending on the size of the gift, uh, you and certainly online you can make any kind of a uh, you know certificate or something uh, that you can print out of fairly readily, uh, and they're pretty readily available. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but do acknowledge those receipts. Uh, people who give money like to have somebody say thank you to them, uh, and it's one of those things that your mom taught you when you were in <laughs> kindergarten. I think there's a book yes. that says something like everything I needed to know in life I learned in kindergarten. And that's uh, certainly true, although I don't think, uh, at least with people I deal with, I'm sure that there are many of us who have not moved beyond the seventh grade. <laughs> so uh, questions we have. One question is, this has uh, to do with a uh, county that uh, levies uh, tax to support the uh, municipal treasuries of cities in the counties and they are asking a question about the um, interlocal agreement and uh, there are a couple of questions um, here uh, I think one of the question is uh, there's some language in the interlocal agreement that says uh, limits the tax to the point zero zero five per hundred dollars of taxable valuation uh, we were talking before we went online. I think that's probably uh, the minimum that's set out in the statute for uh, counties to uh, levy tax on for libraries. Uh, I suspect, I don't want to defame you know, any of our 93 fine counties, but uh, if they could use the money for bridges and roads instead of libraries, they would. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think that uh, really we owe, we owe a debt uh, to the legislature for at least mandating that some of that money goes to libraries. It's, it, it's significant, uh, but it's not a huge amount. And certainly the county could award more, but we all know that they won't mm -hmm. because, uh, you know, books are something that people don't use. Um, there's some language in there. Uh, the question is, can the levies not to exceed that 0 0.005? And that's that's true. That's the way I would read that. Uh, and it says in another paragraph, the amount quoted is 0 0.05. I think that's a typo. So, I think yeah, that's that they, they left a zero out there. Yeah. Uh, you might want to point that out to the uh, county attorney, and I'm sure that the county attorney will fix that. Uh, so uh, you're going to get that levy amount uh, at the 0 0.005 per hundred. And uh, then there's another question about, um, you know, yeah, maybe it's not this one. I was, what, I was looking, uh, oh, it says reviewable on an annual basis. That, that was the question uh, out of the interlocal agreement. Um, the problem you have in dealing with government is trying to commit them to uh, decisions in the future. So you have the current county board, the current county board can vote, yes, we're going to do this, but then what about the next county board or the next one or the one 20 years from now? And that's what this reviewable on an annual basis means, uh, which means the county board can come in and look at it. But again, if that uh, 0.005 per thousand is set by state statute, they don't have any option but to uh, go ahead and uh, levy that tax, collect it and pass it along to the libraries. Uh, then we have uh, a question about a uh, foundation that was created to fund the, the uh, building of a new library. And I think there were a couple of questions in there. The first one is, if, the, uh, if a donor gives money to the municipality, the city, uh, for, for library, then can the city spend the money for something else? And the answer is probably yes. Uh, unless the city acknowledges the gift and acknowledges the restriction, uh, it would just get dumped into their general budget. Now, mm -hmm. it, it seems to me that I, as a donor, can control what my money is going to be used for. Mm -hmm. If the city cannot guarantee to me that it's going to be used the way I want it to be used, then I'm not going to give them the money. Good point, uh, yes. If you are a foundation, you can certainly point that out to people that, that if it goes into your uh, build an addition to the library fund, it will only be used for that purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, and certainly it's a lot easier for a foundation to do that because uh, when times get tough and like they, I think, always are tough, uh, 
the cities are going to be scraping for any dime they can find. And uh, you know, certainly the uh, uh, donated money where maybe they don't technically have to comply with the donor's request would be available. Uh, and they may uh, use it. They may even in intend to put it back, but then they kind of forget about that. Mm -hmm. So I would say uh, certainly if you're promoting the building of a new of a new library, uh, maybe even have the city say, well, you know, give that money to the foundation because mm -hmm. that's what that's what the foundation is there for. Exactly, and that's what in this um, message that this question we received ahead of time, they um, this person explained very clearly that they had a foundation that was originally looked like it was historically originally created to raise money from the community for the building of the library and they seem to really know exactly what they're talking about as far as what a foundation is for it's exactly what it's for because of exactly what Trev said if you just donate and give money to the city or something a check is just cut to the city there is no as you questioned a law that says okay then it has to go on to the library if the city is doing being nice about it, they would, and they would have a line item for that. There would be a line item in the city budget for the library, but that's not necessarily having to do with uh, donations and things like that. And that is exactly why you have a foundation so that you can get the money just that people want to, as you said, I want to donate to give something, have something happen in the library, go to the library's foundation, not just to the city. And that's exactly the whole purpose of why you set up your friend, your foundations. And the, the other game that cities are want to play with uh, donated money is, uh, let's say I'm going to donate, I'm going to, I'm the city, I'm, my budget for the library is $1,000 because we need small numbers because we don't have a calculation. <laughs> and somebody comes in and says, well, I want to give you $100 for the library. I say, well, that's fine. Here's the $100 to the library plus $900 from my budget. Now I've got $100 left over that I can do something else with. <laughs> And the same is true with, right. the, so you got to be careful mm -hmm. about that. Uh, and uh, you just need to make sure that that's not what's going to happen mm -hmm. uh, with your money. I think the other question that they had asked had to do with uh, funding some purchases of computers right. uh, and whether they had to pay sales tax on that. Uh, the answer is you probably do have to pay sales tax on the purchase uh, unless Okay. Purchases by a nonprofit uh, for their uh, nonprofit use are probably exempt from sales tax, but you have to file what's called a Form 13 with the vendor, and it, you yes. show them your your uh, state tax exemption that number. That you are tax exempt. Yep. That you're mm -hmm. tax exempt, and you can avoid some of the sales tax. But the other question they asked is, well, what if the city bought it and we just reimbursed the city? That's going to be better because the vendor is going to be more likely to think, well, I don't have to charge sales tax to the city. Mm -hmm. And and then you can reimburse the city for it. And that's that's fine. I don't have there, there's no issue with doing that. So you have options of which so you, way to do it. You yeah. Have, yeah, you have options. The other thing I would point out, if you're looking at things like technology purchases and you have some time to work with it, try to work with your local school district uh, because the school districts mm -hmm. do aggregate their purchases. Oh, sure. Now, aggregation can lead to aggravation. See, there's my fun. <laughs> because it's not going to be real fast. So if you want a computer tomorrow, uh, that's not going to work for you. But if it's a systematic replacement, uh, going to your school district and saying, hey, we'd like to help fund uh, a computer purchase for the, the the city library can can we aggregate with the school district join can, with you guys yeah, yeah and, and there may be some possibilities for that I know mm -hmm. I sat on the Nebraska uh, Technology uh, Commission for a while and we were working very hard on trying to make it possible for schools to be able to aggregate their purchasing power for things like mm -hmm. internet yes and things like computers and other technology so uh, if you're not in a crisis where you have to have the computer today because the card catalog computer broke down yesterday, yeah. uh, you may be able to uh, aggregate planning those ahead, and, yeah. and plan ahead. And you know, sure, take advantage of that. Talk to your uh, talk to your uh, uh, school librarians about that. Talk to the the school district. See if you can if you can uh, work in, or even if uh, if your city library can work with the school to to aggregate their purchases. I don't know whether that's possible or not, uh, but it, it could be. On that's a city worth, by city or time by time basis, yeah. Some may be worth, able to and some, yeah. And it's worth looking at because yeah. if, if your school district says, well, yeah, you know, we're, we're buying 5,000 computers and if you want, we'll talk to our vendor. Yeah. And they may say, well, yeah, if the city wants a couple, what difference is it? Yeah. 
So uh, do take that opportunity. Uh, did we have any other questions? Um, did we put everybody to sleep? I don't know. No, people seem to. Everyone's still here. Um, if anybody, ha if you, any of you have any specific questions about situations at your library or with your foundation or city or anything, uh, type them into the question section. Um, either a specific situation you're trying to figure out or something you're curious about that we haven't mentioned here. Um, as I said, there is the document that's going to have a lot of links to things that we talked about today and even to other more useful things for you um, that we'll get to you afterwards. Um, the only last question here is about um, oh. what other what types, types of nonprofits would be tax exempt. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what would apply. I mean, we already kind of mentioned the foundation being part of this library or doing it through the city. Right. The, there are a number of other organizations that are tax exempt. For example, like the uh, uh, Shriners, uh, Elks Club, the Moose Club, the Eagles, uh, all of those service organizations are tax exempt. Mm. Depends on which section they're exempt under. Uh, mm. To be a C3, uh, no significant part of your uh, activities uh, can be directed toward influencing legislation. So uh, a group like the, the NRA, for example, the, the National Rifle Association is uh, a nonprofit, but I, I, I can't recall whether it's a 501c3 because they certainly do try to influence legislation. They may be mm -hmm. a 501c4. Uh, organization, which uh, means that uh, the contributions may not be deductible uh, for you know, federal income tax purposes. Um, C3 organizations mm -hmm. could run the gambit from uh, religious organizations to uh, educational uh, type organizations. Uh, if you've got somebody, the Lincoln Track Club, Mm -hmm. uh, is, I'm fairly certain, uh, a 501c3. You could have a, a you know, local archery club or something that could be sure. could be a 501c3. As long as they're not influencing um, legislation, mm -hmm. uh, they would qualify. And they and they file the form right. uh, to be to get the 501c3 designation. Um, That's the thing I know. Some of our libraries have had. Um, confusion about or unsure um, and this has to do with just staff turnover director turnover are we a 501c3 are we not is our foundation who has the paperwork <laughs> nobody can find it uh, that's been an, an issue yeah, you, yeah, can, you, you can always, you can check I think on yeah. the IRS website mm -hmm. look uh, up with, your, like, your institution your, yeah with your institution they'll yeah. tell you whether you're a 501c3 now I will tell you that the IRS is trying to, to boot those uh, tax exempt organizations that are really not functioning. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you're not filing uh, returns, and I believe uh, I looked at this one time for a 501c3, and I think there's a special type return you file that says, "Hey, yeah, we're out here. We just didn't generate enough income to to file a tax return, but, but we we're, still we're still exist." Yeah. And you want yeah you want to make sure that that gets filed uh, on a on an annual basis. They want to uh, clean up all the dead. So you, because yeah. if you get uh, dead wood, <laughs> decertified, I guess, or mm. uh, un un C three, <laughs> then you have to go back through and do the application, pay the fee over again. So uh, let's try to avoid that uh, and keep doing uh, the regular submissions. At least you don't have to start from scratch. Again. Right. Yeah. Right. It's a lot easier to already be there, and then you don't have to start all over again. Yeah. And hopefully you you have. You know, when you're looking for board members, that's why you want to try to find an accountant and a lawyer oh, yeah. to sit on your board uh, or to at least be available to consult. Mm -hmm. And accountants and lawyers generally will provide as long as, you know, please don't ask us to do 75 hours worth of free legal work for you. But an hour here and an hour there, not mm -hmm. that big a deal. Most people would be happy to do that for you. Get a, get a, become friends with somebody who does this kind of thing to or, help out the land. Or put, put the local banker. Uh, on mm -hmm. your board, so the local banker can call their attorney, <laughs> and then the attorney is going to say, "Oh, okay, uh, I can help. I sure I can help." Yeah. I want to keep in good graces with the bank, of course. That's, you know, we we know where the the bread is buttered, mm -hmm. so follow let's uh, you know let's let's follow the money and and uh, and and no, I will say for for lawyers, we get a bad rep on a lot of things, but uh, there are lawyers out there who would be more than happy to help you. Mm -hmm. uh, again, just be respectful of their time. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
All right, so it doesn't look like anybody typed in any other questions while we were chatting here. Um, that's okay. Um, you either answered everything they ever wanted to know about all of this, or they're completely stunned and don't know what to say. <laughs> there's, there's one other thing we ought to talk about, because sometimes this happens and people are annoyed about it. Um, if you are a 501c3, the public is entitled to see parts of your tax return. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a restriction, I think, on the donor list. I don't think you have to provide the complete donor list, but you'll want to check with the IRS website and see for sure. I, I think it's donors under 250 you don't have to show, mm -hmm. uh, but you do have to provide a copy of your tax return for public inspection if requested. I believe it's at, the, at your office. Uh, the IRS has this, a site uh, or on its site has that information so they can get it online. But uh, do be mindful of that. I know a lot of times people say, well, I don't think I have to show that to them. And the answer is, well, yeah, you do. Because of being a nonprofit, yeah. Because you're a nonprofit and, uh, you know, that's that's part of the transparency. Mm -hmm. uh, but you do want to protect the donor list um, to the extent you can, I think, as a, as a matter of self-preservation, if nothing else. Sure. So what if someone wanted to be an anonymous donor? That's coming. Is that from that I, comes from the donor? Yeah, side? that comes from the donor That's side, different. and I think they could they could ask to be anonymous. And I would simply say you want to look on the have that on the, IR, yeah. on the IRS site. Make sure mm -hmm. that that's okay uh, to not disclose. Uh, you know, where the money's coming from. Okay, so you hear about that. Like, usually it's the big ones, like the, an anonymous donation of 1.5 million. So it's not your usual local yeah, people. Yeah, <laughs> right. And, and if, if you're getting a $1.5 million donation, I think you could, you, you, could certainly, you could certainly talk to your, your board uh, attorney and uh, figure out a way to try to make that uh, to accommodate the, the donor's request there. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. the donor's attorney may have oh, yeah. a solution for that as well. Uh, or if it's not, if you can't keep Trev Peterson out, you, you might be able to say uh, the Lincoln Community Foundation Trust or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are some, some ways. Mentioned. There are some ways to do that, and uh, you know, certainly uh, talk talk to the the board accountant and the board attorney and see if there are ways to uh, respect that that donor's request. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think uh, the key things here, I think a lot of library directors and, and um, board presidents are concerned about is they don't know all of this information and the statutes and the rules and things. And I think the key is find a lawyer to help work with you um, or an accountant that can, who does work with these kind of things daily, more so daily than you do, who can then be your advisor in some of these areas. Um, the city may have an, an accountant and attorney as well. Um, I've experienced that sometimes they, um, work more for the city than the library sometimes and you might need your own advisor um, to keep things a little separate there like we were talking about earlier that city just wants to take any money that comes to them and goes to the city general fund and do with what they like you need someone who will help you deal with yours money going to your specifically to the library so um, you're not alone reach out to people who can um, help you and give you advice on these things okay. yeah all right no last minute desperate questions. We're a little after 11 o'clock here. That's fine. Um, we started a little after 10, so um, that's a perfect timing. Yeah. Right. And we were concerned about if we were going to do if we're going to get finished. Yeah, absolutely. we did for everything. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Trev, for coming here You're and welcome. being with us today. This was great. This is a lot of really useful information for libraries, and I'm sure um, we have lots of people that um, come in afterwards and watch our recordings of this. Um, not everybody can be here Wednesday mornings, and that's fine. So um, I'm hoping we'll get this out there to a lot more libraries um, with the resources and everything um, to help them out. And certainly send the link to all your friends in Wisconsin. Yes. <laughs> Tell them, hey, you were on you were, don't you were, you were talking you were about featured. you were featured, featured on this. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, somebody had to be. <laughs> somebody had to be. And it was either them or Vermont. So there you have it. Pick one, yeah. Um, all right. So thank you, Trev. Thank you everyone for being here with us this morning. I'm gonna switch over to the Encompass Live website now. Um, if you do Google or use your search engine of choice, Encompass Live is the only thing called that on the internet so far. Yay. Don't anybody use this name. Um, and you'll find our uh, main website on the Library Commission's page where we have our upcoming shows. But I was gonna show you the show has been recorded. And right underneath our upcoming shows is a link to our archives. 
And here's the most recent one here. Um, so this one should be up by the end of the day today on this page here. We'll have a link to the recording and um, the document that um, Trev's going to email to me or have his assistant, uh, Christine, yeah. her name again? Uh, Stephanie. Stephanie. Ah, Stephanie. Send it to me later. We'll have access to that as well. Um, everyone who attended this morning and registered for today's show will get notice of when the recording is available on here. Um, we also post it to our various uh, social um, we have a mailing list to the Library Commission and a Facebook page and Twitter. It'll all be out there, too. Uh, while we're looking at the archives, I want to show you this is the full archives for the entire um, run of Encompass Live. Uh, this is the 11th year of the show. So we do have the show our um, recordings here going back to the very first one in January 2009. Uh, so do be aware. You see we have a search here. You can search the full archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want just recent info. Um, and then you can type in whatever t term uh, keyword you want. Um, but do pay attention when you are looking at a recording. They're all dated of when they are, were originally broadcast. Um, some of the resources on here might not exist anymore. Some links may be broken. Some things may have changed in how they um, services works or programs work and, and since the time it was originally broadcast, but just pay attention when you're reviewing our archives. Um, we are librarians and this is what we do. We archive and save things. So we will have the full history always up there, even if it becomes outdated information. But that's why everything has a date on there for you. So um, that will be for today's show. Um, I hope you'll join us next week. Um, oh, I also mentioned that we do have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. Um, so we will post over there. I'd mentioned social media. Here's a reminder to log in for today's show. When the recording is available, we'll post on here. No, I don't want to log in right now. Thank you, Facebook. Um, so we remind people of that. So if you are big on Facebook, um, uh, do give us a like over there, and you'll get notices of when we have new shows coming up when recordings are available. So I hope you join us next week when our topic is OER. What is OER? Outstanding Extraordinary Raw Materials, sometimes. Um, but it is actually um, open educational resources, specifically. And um, Beth Cavish, who is from our Educational Service Unit Coordinating Council here in Nebraska, will be here to talk about um, this OER hub that they have set up for um, schools and in the state. And it's um, out there for anyone to use in the state. So um, join us next week. Beth will be here to talk about OER. Uh, and please do sign up for any of our other shows. We've got our next two months uh, scheduled here. We've got new ones will be coming up for the summer. So keep an eye on our website. So thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you. Coming over here, Trev. And I hope we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Bye bye. Camera.